Hello everyone, I'm Thomas, and together with Drew, Jose, Bavier, and Michael, we're here today to discuss a deep learning review paper published in the Nature magazine. All right, deep learning. For the briefest of brief introductions, deep learning is effectively machine learning made complex or given nuance. Conventional machine learning as we know is very powerful yet also limited in potential. You must not only sufficiently pre-process your data to obtain meaningful results, but also possess the appropriate domain expertise and engineering know-how to find or develop a suitable processing pipeline. Even then, it can be troublesome fitting a data set to a machine learning model, as outside of various tweaks, many are inherently limited in just what they can learn on. What deep learning provides is an answer to many of these issues. Not only can this class of algorithmic techniques process raw data without any need for significant pre-processing, but it can do so autonomously with minimal human engineering required. Plus, because deep learning models often utilize many computational layers in their algorithms, they can better identify intricate structures in higher dimensional data more basic machine learning models cannot. In short, it's the tool to explore when the complexity of your system grows too much. In terms of deep learning types, there are several we will discuss, with the first being supervised learning. Much like basic machine learning, this is the most common form, where a data set is manually labeled and the model is trained on it for maximum accuracy. Accuracy in this case is maximized through the adjustment of model parameters called weights. By changing these veritable knobs, the model output is affected and the accuracy changes. Typically, this is done via gradient vector, which each weight possesses, whereby the goal is to reach the gradient's minimum. Every iteration adjusts the weight value so the gradient slope approaches zero until the minimum is reached. Once done, the model, accuracy, or the model has maximized its accuracy. Although conceptually simple, for deep learning this gradient minimization often occurs for hundreds of thousands if not millions of weights simultaneously, and also over multiple layers. Each layer effectively builds on the other by using it as a training data set, enabling increasing abstraction and therefore better analysis of more complex data. In short, challenges like distinguishing dogs from wolves, for example, which conventional machine learning struggles with, are made easy in this case when a deep learning model is applied to the task. Backpropagation is an algorithm used in the training of feedforward neural networks. Backpropagation is used to compute the gradient of an objective function with respect to the weights of the network. The backpropagation algorithm works by starting with the error at the output and working backwards, propagating the gradient through each layer to the input. The image on the left shows how a network uses backpropagation to distort the input space in order to make classes linearly separable. In the 90s, it was first thought that neural networks in backpropagation using gradient descent would have poor performance, as the model would get stuck at local minima, where small changes would not further reduce the error. However, in practice, this is rarely the case, as the majority of these points result in solutions that are of similar quality. Backpropagation is a practical application of the chain rule for derivatives. The equations on the right show how the chain rule can be used to relate two small changes, a change of x on y and of y on z. A small change in x, delta x, is transformed to a change in y, delta y, by multiplying by the partial derivative dy dx. Similarly, delta y is then related to the change in z, delta z. This shows us how the change in x, delta x, is related to delta z through the multiplication of dy dx and dz dy. This also works when x, y, and z are vectors in the derivatives of Jacobian matrices. The first step in the backpropagation algorithm is forward propagation. This is where the total input to each layer is calculated. This is a weighted sum of the previous outputs. Then a nonlinear function, typically ReLU or sigmoid, is applied to get the final output for the node. Once the final output is achieved, the error between the output and target is calculated. This is then used to compute the error derivative with respect to the output of each node. The error derivative with respect to the output is then converted to the error derivative with respect to the input by multiplying by the gradient. These values are then used to update the weights in order to minimize the error. This is propagated backwards through the network, repeating these steps at each layer until the input layer is reached. The paper presents us with four key ideas behind convolutional neural networks. They are local connections, shared weights, pooling, and many layers. The concept behind local connections is that local groups of values are highly correlated, and they form distinctive local features that can be easily detected. CNNs are invariant to translation, which means that they can detect features regardless of positional shifts or translation of such features. For example, in those two figures here, us humans can easily identify the sun regardless of its position. 
CNNs can do that as well, by using filters that learn to identify such objects. And those filters are composed by a set of weights that doesn't rely on the location of the object within the image. CNNs explore the properties that natural signals are compositional hierarchies, which means that higher level features are obtained from composing lower level features. Each layer in a CNN acts on the output of the previous layer. The closer to the input a layer is, the data it is acting upon gets rawer. In other words, it is less organized. So, the first layers learn how to detect lower level features, and in the case of images, it can be simple straight edges. As we get deeper into the network, layers learn how to detect more complex features, like curved edges, and then shapes, and then textures, and so on and so forth. Another operation that's happening in between layers is the pooling. Pooling means picking the maximum value of a local group of features and discarding the rest. This reduces the dimension of the representation. The effect is creating an inverse to small shifts and distortions in the output of each layer. Going back to the sun example of the previous slide, you can think that after a pooling layer, the number of possible places in the image where the sun can be is reduced. The paper cites some reasons for the success of CNNs, efficient use of GPUs, more training examples due to data augmentation, and faster training due to the progress in hardware, software, and algorithmic parallelization. Now, we will understand distributed representation and its use in neural language model. To understand distributed representation, first we talk about a non-distributed representation, sometimes also called as localist representation. Localist representation is like what we get from a one-hot encoder. It is easy to understand and code by hand, but it is very inefficient when the data has componential structure. Take an example given in the figure on the right hand side. Here, we are using local representation to represent the given input shapes. There are three problems with this approach. First, whenever there is an additional input, we need to increase our dimensionality. Second, it doesn't tell us how shapes like horizontal rectangle and vertical rectangle are related to one another. Lastly, if a feature is common between multiple inputs, there is no way to differentiate. The inefficiencies we discussed with the localist representation are addressed by distributed representations, where there is a many-to-many -many relationship between two types of representations such as concepts and neurons. So, each concept is represented by many neurons and each neuron participates in the representation of many concepts. Again taking the similar example, with distributed representation, we can tell how a particular shape is related to any other shape like horizontal rectangle and vertical rectangle. Also, an additional input like circle can be accommodated by a yet another combination of the neurons. An added benefit of distributed representation is its compactness. As for n binary features, we can describe 2 raised to the power n different combinations. Before neural language model, the standard approach to statistical modeling of language was based on counting frequencies of occurrences of short symbol sequences of length up to n, called n grams. n grams treat each word as an atomic unit, so they cannot generalize across semantically related sequences of words. Neural language models, however, exploit the distributed representations. Each word is associated with a vector of real valued features, and semantically related words end up close to each other in that vector space as shown in the figure. Let's understand briefly how neural language models predict the next word in a sequence from a context of earlier words. Each word in the context is presented to the network as a one of n vector, that is, one component has a value of 1 and the rest are 0. In first layer, each word creates a different pattern of activations or word vector. A word vector or word embedding is a methodology to map words to form a corresponding vector of real numbers. Other layers of the network learn to convert the input word vectors into an output word vector for the predicted next word. This output vector can be used to predict the probability for any word in the vocabulary to appear as the next word. So now let us talk about recurrent neural networks or RNNs. To put it simply, recurrent neural networks have connections between nodes where the outputs from previous time steps are fed as input to the current time step so that it forms a directed or undirected graph along a temporal sequence. One advantage is that this allows the network to maintain a state vector in their hidden units that contains info on all of the past elements of the sequence. This allows the recurrent network make predictions from over a lot of time steps. Thus, RNNs are preferable for tasks that involves training in things such as predicting the next character or word in the text. One effective way to visualize these recurrent networks is through what the industry calls unfolding. 
In the diagram showing in front of you right now, S are the nodes at different time step from which the hidden units group together, X are the input sequence, and O are the output sequence. S, X, and O are with respect to time, or T. On the other hand, U, V, and W matrix parameters stay constant with respect to time. The black square that seems to be going in the clockwise direction is used to depict the nodes getting the input from the previous steps, or X, with respect to T in this case, and maps it into an output output sequence that is labeled as O with respect to T, and thus the output will depend on all of the previous sequence inputs. One interesting thing mentioned from the paper is that RNNs have problems with learning long-term dependencies, with which when we read related literature this is due to vanishing gradient. I find this a bit interesting as from the diagrams before, U, V, and W matrices should be constant throughout with respect to time. Nevertheless, long short-term memory is a type of RNN that has a memory cell with which it copies itself while accumulate external signal. These LSTM networks are proved to be more effective and also enables innovations such as entire speech recognition system. And this concludes our presentation. Thank you for listening.